Uh, welcome to ML Lunch again. Uh, today we have uh, Kriti. She's uh, done her master's from IIT Bombay and now she's doing a PhD here with Eric Jim. And she's uh, in LTI, works on some bomb bio stuff, on some vision stuff, and she's going to talk about that today. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. So I'm Kriti Punyani. So the idea is that I want to predict trends, and the only input that I have is tweet IDs. So all I know about these people is their Twitter IDs. So what can I do? So you, you go collect data, that's not surprising. But what kind of data can you collect to make these friendship networks? The first idea is that you can collect people's tweets and analyze the topics of the tweets. The key assumption being that if people talk about similar things, then they probably are more likely to be friends. The second thing is if you're uploading pictures on Twitter and these are pictures of you hanging out with somebody else, you're going to be friends with each other. If you're uploading pictures of the same things, you probably have common interests and you should be friends. And finally, if you're linking about similar things, you again have common interests and you should be friends. So the, I want to make two points about this example. The first one is that you could actually use any one of these single data sources to make predictions or you could combine them. But before you start running your experiment, it's not obvious which of these data sources is more important. The second point I want to make is that real friendships are complicated, and all of the things that I'm analyzing is a very simple assumption behind them, which is common interests. And it's not actually necessary that common interests will actually lead to you making friends. You could be friends because of geographical reasons, because of age reasons. And as people, we assume that this is okay. It's okay that you're looking at only one dimensional of, friend of friendship and still trying to predict friends between people. So what happens when you look at genes instead? So when I look at genes, I don't actually want to predict friends. My true, the, the true thing I want to predict is parents of these genes. What do I mean by this concept? So say I'm a biologist and I'm studying a disease. Uh, let's say I'm studying diabetes then we all know that diabetes is caused because of lack of production of insulin. So the first question that you might start studying is, when, you are, when insulin is not being produced in the body, what genes are controlling the production of it? And what genes are responsible for destroying the production of it? And then of course this leads to the next question, which is, who are the genes that are controlling the genes that are controlling insulin? On the whole, I'm actually looking for a gene regulatory network where every node in this network is a gene, and an edge is a directed edge that says who's regulating whom. Predicting a gene regulatory network is a really hard concept because it has cycles. And as machine learning people, we know that dealing with cycles is really hard when you're learning from uh, single dimensional data. So instead of looking at directed graphs, we're going to again make a very a simplified assumption and try to predict interaction network. An interaction network is going to again be an undirected graph where a link only means that these two genes interact. So just like I had to define what does friendship mean, and I said friendship means common interests, what does gene interaction mean? So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to assume that a, a two genes are going to interact if they are co-expressed at the same place and at the same time. And this, is, this sounds a little reasonable. If there are two genes and they're both active in your brain, maybe they're doing something together and are involved in brain development and so on. So the question then arises, how do you measure gene expression in a spatial and temporal manner on a large scale? So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about a specific organism that's Drosophila. Uh, that's a fruit fly. That's the least creepy photo of a fruit fly that I could find in Google. Um, and I'm actually not going to look at the fruit fly itself, but embryos of these flies. So this is a data set collected by the Berkeley Drosophila Genome Project. The first version of this data set came out 10 years ago, so it's a long-term project. 
they expect to keep collecting data for the next 10 years as well. Um, so it's only going to get bigger. The data right now is of 7,500 genes. Uh, it's a total of 100,000 images. And it's collected by using a technology called in situ hybridization. So what does this data look like? Here are two examples of images from this, key, from this data set. The image on the left is of a particular gene. The name of the gene is CC10197. And the age of the embryo has also been labeled by the person who collected the data. So this particular embryo is from stage 4 to 6. There are six particular, six possible time points in my data set. So I actually have data from six time points. So the embryo itself is, looks like a football. And the blue color in the embryo is telling you where in this embryo is the gene expression active. So in this particular uh, embryo, the gene expression, you should think of it as being active in the neck of the embryo. In this embryo, you can see the blue dot, which is the expression being at the corner. And what actually happens is that when the fruit fly grows, eventually, these, well, these become stripes that eventually form the segments of the fly itself, of the, of the body of the fly. On the whole, there are a lot of images. Uh, as you can see, some of these images are partial because the biologist just got excited by what the pattern looks like. And in some images, you have overlapping embryos or embryos touching each other. And we have to take care of all of this. But at the end of it, I want to make a prediction that says that if these are two images and they both have expression in the head of the embryo, then they probably are going to interact with each other. So if I think of it from a cartoon perspective, at a single time point, for every gene, I have a set of images being collected. I think of these as bags of images per gene. And I have multiple time points. And I want to predict the network. So since this data set has been out in public for the last 10 years, what have people been doing with this so far? So the majority of people collecting this data set have been working on how do you index and retrieve both the images, as well as the metadata associated with it. There's been work on how do you develop robotics to make this process faster. It took us 10 years to do 100,000 images. Can we do the next 100,000 faster? Uh, there's been a lot of efforts on how do you automatically annotate these images by saying where in the, in the image's expression is present, and to label how old the MPO is at the time of image collection. And finally, there has been some work to actually analyze the expression pattern themselves. But uh, most of this work has either looked at only manual annotations instead of looking at the images, or it's run experiments on seven images, which is really a very small data set, and we're not sure if this is even a convincing result. So the question of how do you analyze ISH images to predict gene interactions remains open. So in this talk, we're going to talk about how do you predict gene interactions from ISH data by looking at both spatial and temporal gene expression. So I'm going to divide this talk into three parts. Uh, the first part is going to be about extracting features from these images. And this is a pipeline that we propose. It's called X squared. The second part is going to talk about turning a network from only spatial data. And this is called GINIM. And finally, I'm going to talk about NT-Master, which is new work that tries to combine information from multiple data sources to obtain spatial temporal networks. So Spectre is work on how you extract gene expression patterns from these images. Uh, it tends to be a very uh, image processing heavy paper, so I'm not going to talk much about it, but I'm going to give you the key highlight of what does it do. So first I'm going to point out that actually analyzing expression patterns is hard. So if you look at standard feature sets, which is the SIP feature <coughs> in computer vision algorithm, and I take around 3,000 images and I cluster them. Then for 15 clusters, for every cluster, I'm plotting the mean image of this cluster. It turns out that some of these, what these images are capturing is, what the clusters are capturing is variations in the incidence of light. So for example, the top image um, at the corner has light being incident on, it on the bottom right. This particular cluster is only capturing embryos which are aligned in a non-horizontal fashion, and so on. So this is not very, not very good. What Spectra does is it starts with an image that looks like this. It first finds the embryo and in the, in the image itself. And then actually standardizes the embryo expression pattern to get a very clear picture of where the, ex 
expression is there. Note that it looks like the image has been split. This is because one of the important questions that happens when you look at an embryo is that the embryo has a head, and we want always that the head should be on the left, and it has, well, a tail, and it has a stomach and a back, and I want that the stomach should always be to the top of the image. So we're going to learn classifiers where if the stomach is to the bottom of the image, in this, as in this particular example, I'm going to flip the image so that the stomach goes to the top. So the overall pipeline looks like this. You start with the original image. You find where the embryo is in the image. You register the embryo so that the AP axis of the embryo is horizontal. And then you collect for the orientation. So you run a classifier predicting where the head and the stomach of the embryo are. And at the end of this, you have a sandbelt embryo which can be compared across multiple images without worrying about the position, the size, the direction of the light, and so on. <coughs> the next thing you do is you actually extract the stain by converting the RGB into, uh, and capturing where the blue color was in this particular image. And finally, you learn a marker and field based image segmentation algorithm mm -hmm. that segments out noise to give out a very clear expression pattern of where this was present. This gene expression pattern can then be represented using your favorite feature representation algorithm and used for further tasks like classification and clustering. So I don't actually have the time to talk about each of these parts separately, but I'm gonna give you two quick results. The first thing is that we have some external annotations that allow us to run classification on these images. So I want to classify whether this image, where in the image is expression present. So the two blue bars give you classification accuracy in a problem where there are 10 classes. Um, and this is run over multiple class. We run cross validation for it. The two blue, the two blue plots are our network with two different classifiers. One a simple classifier, which is the SPM, and second is a more complicated classifier that people have proposed for this specific problem. And these two are baseline systems that are present in that were were found in the literature earlier. And we see that for both accuracy as well as for F1 score, the features extracted by spec square outperform the baseline systems uh, in a significant manner. And the p values are within other ways. The second thing is, when I started, I said that it's actually hard to cluster images and get meaningful gene expression patterns. So in this particular example, we again clustered around 3,000 images into 15 clusters, and for every cluster, I'm plotting the mean image of these expression patterns. And you can actually see that these expression patterns seem to have meaning. There are patterns that look at expression in the tail, others that look at expression in the head, and then there's this uh, pattern that says that the expression is present at the base of the embryo. And these are well-known examples of how we expect Drosophila embryonic expressions to look like. And I'll again, I have to emphasize that each of these images might be average of hundreds of gene expression patterns. And the average looking so clean is actually a very dramatic result. So, so far I quickly talked about how Spectre converts these raw images into some kind of expression patterns that can be uh, analyzed in future computational tasks. The next question we want to look at is how do you use these expression patterns to learn gene interaction networks from data at a single time? In general, 
by in the same capital and looking at mean, you could actually look at any statistic of these images. Uh, and in fact, you could build a vector of statistics like the, the max, the median, the mean, and so on. The second problem that happens is that genes <coughs> in our bodies interact in pathways. This means that gene A will affect gene B, B will affect C, C will affect D, and so on. <coughs> so if you look at correlation or similarity between your genes, you're going to get a lot of high similarities in peaks. Because when A affects B and B affects C, indirectly A is affecting C as well. And so this is not, we're not really happy with this. So what we instead want to do is we want to analyze conditional independence between these nodes to predict our network. And by using conditional independence, we can get rid of some of these edges and get higher accuracy or lower false positive rates. <coughs> and finally, what we want to do is we want sparsity, so we don't want the prediction of the interactions to have low weights for many edges, but we want a lot of these edges to go to zero. So since we know that our input now is a kernel where the kernel is allowing me to compute the similarity between two genes, I have to learn conditional independencies by learning a graphical model by starting from this kernel as input. So one of the ways you can do that is that you, map, you minimize the Bregman divergence between the input kernel and the predicted sparse network that you're interested in. And to make it sparse, we're going to put a sparsity in a way. So Bregman divergence between two matrices looks, which looks like this function. And you have to specify the function f that you're interested in, which is in which space are you computing this divergence. So by using f to be the log that divergence, you get an objective function that looks like this. And this turns out to be a convex, ob a convex object. <coughs> and the nice thing is that it also turns out to be an objective that has been studied <coughs> many times by many people in the last five years um, to figure out how do you do fast optimization for it. So my favorite optimization method for this is an algorithm called g lasso that does block coordinate descent over these, um, over the objective function to get the solution. But at this point, there are many, many, many algorithms present to just work on how you do optimization for this particular thing. Now, because of the presence of this sparsity or L1 constraint in my objective function, the predicted network that I'm going to have is going to have a lot of precise zeros. And because of that, at the end of it, I can just read out the non-zeros in my network to be the predicted edges, which the predicted gene interaction. So as I said, this problem, this particular objective function has been studied a lot in the literature. But when they started studying it, they, the, the problem was studied <coughs> from the notion of the data being generated from a known distribution, which is the Gaussian distribution. So if the data had been Gaussian, there's been work that shows that the estimate of these edges is consistent. That means that as you get more and more data, you're going to converge to the right answer of what these edges were, or what these gene interactions were, with very high accuracy. The problem is that we didn't start with data, we actually started with the kernel. So the question is, how do you, what does it mean <coughs> for a kernel to have a distribution? So if you remember, any kernel is, uh, can be represented as an inner product in some space phi. This means that if the data was Gaussian in the space phi that you started with, then I know that my algorithm is consistent. And it turns out that because I'm taking means and medians of image data, it's extremely simple to show that for the statistic kernel that we use, the choice, the multi instance kernels that we were using, the data follows a sub Gaussian distribution. So since the data follows a sub Gaussian distribution, and there's been work that says that if the data was sub Gaussian, it's consistent. <coughs> Even though it's consistent, uh, theoretically, we still want to verify this in practice. So what we do is we actually do linear fits of the data and look at what the mean absolute errors are in each fit. The idea is that if your distribution function was true, then your absolute error in your linear fits should be small. And we verify that this is the case. We ran this experiment for around 2,000 genes, and for 99.5% of these genes, the absolute error was less than 0 0.05, which is 
is a very nice and small number. The second thing that we worry about is that we're looking at errors in predicting an image. So at the end of it, you're predicting your linear fits are analyzing image data. And so the question is, in what parts of these images are you actually finding error? And is there a bias in what parts of the image can you not predict well? So the, the, the plot looks extremely light because in fact the errors are so small that it's very hard to plot. The red in the image shows positions in the embryo where you always predict higher than expected. The blue shows positions in the embryo where you predict lower than expected. And while they do seem to be clustered a little bit, um, we've actually had to have ask a biologist to interpret what this means. And it turns out that there's no bias in this, which is, which is good news. And finally, I kind of glossed over this, but when we started, we looked at the idea that you can compare two images by looking at the covariance between them. When you look at the covariance between two images, you are implicitly assuming that the data is IID. But you know that, in fact, pixels in an image are highly correlated with each other. This means that the data is not actually independent of its adjacent points. So one question that we can ask is, what happens for your algorithm if your data is not independent of each other? So in this particular plot, on the x-axis, I'm plotting a parameter that simulates data. As you increase the value of the parameter, you are increasing the dependence between adjacent data points. So when the parameter value is zero, this means that I have truly IID data. As I increase the parameter value, if it goes to one, that means you're going to sample the same points again and again from the distribution. And the question is, how does the algorithm fare as this dependence increases? So for both precision and decon, you can see that for up to a value of around 0.7 um, in your dependence parameter, the algorithm actually does quite well. And this is kind of good to know and verify when you're looking at such highly correlated data. Okay, so let's talk about some quick results. So this is an example on only 12 images from six genes. Some images are repeated, some genes are multiple images, for example, Huntback, which has the top three images. And images like Bicoid, which is BCD, have only one image in this data set. And we see that the algorithm, Dina and does a reasonable job. Um, it predicts, it connects the two images which have which have expression in the head, it connects the images which have expression in three parts, in three slides, mm -hmm. and the image on the top is considered to be too different from all the others, so it's not connected to anything. Okay, so as I said, Jinnah, since it predicts data from, since Jinnah predicts network from a single time <coughs> point, in theory I could predict, I could run an experiment six times for my six time point. Uh, Right now, I'm going to only talk about two time points. So we're going to look at a time point called 9 to 10, which has around 3,000 images, and a uh, time point 13 to 16, which has around 6,000 images of 3,000 genes. So when I visualize the network predicted by Jinayan for the two time points, I find that almost impossible to see, but red Red edges are edges within a cluster, and green edges are edges across clusters. So the ratio of within cluster to total number of edges in, in these two networks is around 70% and 87% for the two networks. <coughs> this means that the estimated network that Chinam has predicted is highly modular. And this is important because when you look at biological networks, you expect that there'll be different modules that do different functions. So getting modules in the Jinan network is a, is a very good sign. Okay, the next thing that we do is something called as enrichment analysis. So let's say I wanted to cluster these points. I have 20 points or 20 balls and I cluster them, but I don't know these labels of green and red beforehand. Now I would expect that if I was doing random selection, there would be only one and a half out of the six balls in the, or in the inside the orange cluster. If you were doing random selection of, of balls, you would expect only one and a half of them to be red. But what we observe is that we saw that four out of these six balls are red. This tells me that the cluster one is enriched for red balls, and I can explicitly verify this by running a hypothesis test, specifically a hypergeometric test, that allows me to test if a specific 
specific color is more enriched than what you would get by random selection. So when you do gene enrichment analysis on a network, what we want to do is we want to cluster the network. This basically means that you divide the network into smaller subparts, and in every subpart you expect that genes of the same function should be in the same subpart. So you expect that functions should be enriched in specific clusters in my network. The same way I expect that, for example, genes that are all expressed in the head should appear in the same sub-network. So if I have some manual spa spatial annotations about these genes, I would expect them to be enriched for different clusters in my network. And uh, remember that since there are multiple functions and multiple annotations, I'll have to correct for multiple hypothesis tests before I start running these experiments. So this is what the result looks like. Uh, what I've done is I've taken for each of the networks, I've taken the 12, I've taken the network and divided it into 12 sub-networks. And for every sub-network, I'm doing an enrichment hypothesis test. The x-axis is plotting the 12 clusters, so I have these 12 sub-networks. The y-axis is plotting the spatial annotations that we know of. So for example, there are, these are really hard to read, these are just things that are labeled. There's embryonic hind duct, embryonic salivary gland, and so on. And what I'm expecting to see is that many of these clusters should be enriched for different annotations. And in fact, that turns out to be true. I do a green dot means that there is enrichment of this particular term in this particular cluster. So I'm seeing a lot of this is a nice output. One way of summarizing this result would be to say that in how many of these clusters did I see at least one enrichment? For the 13 to 16 stage, I <coughs> can see all 12 clusters are enriched for at least one spatial annotation. <coughs> In the 9 to 10 network, um, 11 out of the 12 are have at least one enrichment. The one that does not is cluster number 3 here. You can see the vertical line has no green dot. And it turns out that cluster 3 has only 4 genes. So from a statistical perspective, you're not going to get enrichment no matter what you do. So if I wanted to summarize this network, I would say that for stage 9 to 10, I have 11 out of the 12 clusters have been enriched. And for stage 13 to 16, all 12 clusters were enriched. So I can compare this with what kind of results would you get if you were analyzing microarray data instead of ISS genome data. On the x-axis here, I vary the number of clusters that I'm dividing the network into to show that this result is not dependent on how many clusters am I analyzing. On the y-axis, I plot the percentage of clusters that were enriched. So 11 out of 12, 12 out of 12, and so on. For the genine, which is in red, you can see that the enrichment is really high. For the 13 to 16 stage, up to 15 clusters, I have 100% enrichment. And over here, I have basically around 90% enrichment, which is very nice. The other thing that we talk about, which again I, um, is that we also know the functions of, this, of these genes. And you can look at functional enrichment instead of spatial enrichment. So it turns out that the huts in the gene network are genes which are connected to many other genes. So you can ask the question, for genes that are connected to many other genes, what functions are they doing? And you would want that these genes should have important functions, whatever they might be. And for the genome network, this actually is true. Uh, these are enriched for functions like cellular respiration, cellular metabolic processes, and so on, which are really things that without these genes being active, things would shut down. And overall, if I have to summarize this, these stages are enriched for 11 and 12 functional annotations. <coughs> On the other hand, for microarray data, the hubs in the microarray network are not enriched at all. Uh, they're enriched for 0 and 1 row annotations in the same data set. So overall, we can see that analyzing the image data by using Janayan is much better than what you could do earlier by analyzing microarray data. So, so far, I've talked about Janayan, uh, which is an algorithm to predict a gene interaction network by analyzing spatial gene expression in the data. It looks, like, looks at conditional independence, uh, sparsity in my network, <coughs> and uses multi-instance kernels to handle batch of images. We also did 
a massive experiment to show that the networks that we predict are not just modular but also scale free and that they're enriched for all sorts of interesting things. The next thing I want to do is to combine information from multiple time scales for a spatial temporal network. So this is going to be called NP Master, so it's learning networks from multiple sources of data using the non-parallel model. If I had data from a single source and I wanted to analyze this condition independence that I kept talking about, there's this very well known algorithm that's called the G lasso that predicts your G network. What G lasso assumes is that the data came from a multivariate function. In this case, learning the network is equivalent to estimating the non zeros of the inverse covariance matrix of the function. And so, what we can do is analyze this <coughs> function, which is an actual IQ estimate plus an L1 vectorization. And as we saw, this looks very similar to what we did earlier with kernels, but now we're actually looking at Gaussian data. So we know that we actually have multiple data sets instead of a single data set. How can we combine this information to predict the gene interaction network? So formally, I have k data sources. Each of these are over the same d dimension. But each data source might have a different amount of samples in it. So the number of samples in each data source will be ni, but they're defined over the same space of d genes. And I want to learn the network over these d genes by using these k sources of information. So if I was doing this, how would I do it? The first thing, which is what most people do, is when you collect a new data source, you don't analyze it with your older data sources. You just analyze this new data source. You throw me the rest, you analyze your favorite data source, and you predict the network. The second thing that you can do is, you have k data sets, you run g lasso on each one of these separately, you get k separate network predictions, and now you combine these by, you could run a classifier here, but I don't have any examples of edges, so I can't turn the So what most people do is they say, you use like an and function, an or function, or in general, you predict an edge in your final network if it is present in at least n out of these k networks. <coughs> and then you sit and tune this value of n. And this is actually quite a popular technique when people look at protein, protein networks. The third idea is that since each of these data sets were over the same D gene, I could stack these matrices on top of each other to make a matrix with n data points, n D genes, and run GLASO and get the network. And I'm going to call this algorithm bag of data. So somehow you're putting all your bag of data into a single matrix and analyzing it. So one question that we might ask is, can we do better than all of these three methods? So one thing I'd like to emphasize is that we do assume that we are going to use the same, we are going to estimate the same covariance matrix across the data sources. Because if you remember, the estimate of the covariance matrix is what I'm predicting as my final output. So for each data source, I have to assume that the covariance matrix is the same. I can't give that index <coughs> saying sigma i. It has to be the same sigma. And if that's true, and if the data is actually Gaussian, then it turns out that the optimal solution is actually to do value data. Because effectively, what you've said is that I have data from k data sources, but they're all Gaussian with the same covariance matrix sigma. So once I do mean standardization and variance standardization, I should actually do value data. That's, that's what would work the best. But this is a little disappointing from two reasons. One is that you don't actually expect bag of data to do so well. And secondly, if I have one of my k data sources to have a non Gaussian distribution, then the total, when I put it all together, it's going to give me some very messed up data from an unknown distribution. It's not going to be Gaussian anymore. So, what we're going to do is we're actually going to drop the assumption that the data is Gaussian. The way we do this is by defining a generated model for explaining how was this data truly generated. Again, remember that my data in every source has to come from the same covariance matrix. So I assume that I'm actually sampling a Y from a Gaussian with mean zero and covariance matrix sigma. And then I assume that when you're measuring this data, depending on what data source it is, the data has its unknown transformation, which is a G that transforms my Gaussian data into some 
data x. And x is what I observed. So when I measure the data, I got x, and x is not Gaussian. But if I could estimate a function f, which is the inverse of this g function, then I could get back to the Gaussian data. So having such a generated model allows me to keep both of my assumptions, but drop the Gaussian. of any variable and compute the CDF or the cumulative distribution function of each variable, the distribution of the CDF is uniform. So if I compute this F hat, which is just the cumulative distribution of the observed X's, the distribution of F hat is uniform. So if F hat is uh, uniform, then you can compute the distribution of T inverse of F and that will turn out to be Gaussian, where P is the CDF the standard Gaussian, zero mean and variance one. And if you are actually doing this, you have to control the variance of your estimate. So you have to do some amount of cutoff and so on. And those details are in the paper. But this suggests a really simple algorithm that says, when you have k data sources, for every data source, assume the f so that the data becomes Gaussian. So now you have Gaussian data put all together in a single bag, run g lasso and get your network. So we ran some simulation results. Uh, the three plots here are on having only two data sources, three data sources, and four data sources. <laughs> when I have two data sources, the both data sources have a non-caution distribution. In the separation of three data sources, the third data source is actually truly Gaussian. data source is actually noise. It does not give any information about the problem at hand at all. In every plot, I'm plotting as I gain, as I increase the number of samples available, how does the F1 score of predicting edges vary? So our method is empty marker, it's plotted in red. And as you can see in all three situations, <coughs> empty marker does much better than both GLAS or Bagger data, as well as by combining the network using OR or AND. And also that's better than using only one single network alone. So I'd like to emphasize that both for using the best single network, I have to know what the best single network is. And I'm using the best network on test data. So this is a really strong uh, baseline because it's assuming that the Oracle is going to test and tell you what would be the network that does best on the test data that you're looking at. The same is true for the combining network. When I want to combine two networks, I have to say whether I want to use an OR function or an AND function. And again, I assume that the Oracle tells me which one will do better on test data and use that one. So before I start analyzing image data by using this, we analyze some yeast data sets uh, over around 6,000 genes. And I have two data sets here. One has 18 examples, the other one has 300 examples. It's not surprising that the data set with 300 examples does better than the one with 18 examples. It is surprising though that if you were combining the data by using the bag of data method or by using or or anding and combining the network, in both cases you do worse than what you would have got by only analyzing data source two. And we run this experiment over multiple smaller subsets of the data, and this result still holds true. So it's actually a little disappointing because it's saying that if you were using any of these baselines, you would have been better off just throwing away data set one and doing your analysis. And uh, also, as you can see, actually does better and is able to combine information from the two data sources to get a uh, significant improvement in the prediction. So for all of the methods that we've been analyzing there, the, the result depends on a tuning parameter lambda that controls how sparse was the network that you're predicting. So in this particular plot, I'm actually tuning the value of, la of lambda. Uh, I can tune the number of predicted edges change. And you can see that no matter how many edges I'm predicting, the number of 
video. I don't want all the related videos to be the same as the one that we're looking at <coughs> right now. You want them to be slightly different from each other. And it turns out that uh, under specific conditions of distribution, you can actually show that diversity in ranking is equivalent to condition dependence. And we're currently running some experiments to verify if this is the case in, in real data, but uh, these are still on. Today I talk to you about uh, unsupervised global prediction of interaction networks from multiple image data sources. We talk about how do you do feature extraction from these images by using spec squares. How do you estimate gene networks from this spatial data by using gen ions? And finally, how do you estimate the gene network from multiple sources by using NP markers? And what we're currently doing is we're trying to extend the NP marker algorithm to allow you to use uh, examples of known gene and learn the importance of every data source in the prediction. Thank you. Thank you. 